All right. So at this time, we will sing hymn number 213, The Light of the World is Jesus. too awake and I'm not going to be able to get back to sleep. So oftentimes I will try to get up and make my way to the bathroom and do all this without turning on any lights <laughs> and make my way back without turning on any lights. And then also, not only that, thank you, but I try to kind of stay half asleep, you know? I, I, I just kind of, you know, just try to yeah, yeah, you know, make my way while hopefully staying half asleep so that I, I kind of stay in that sleep mode when I get back to the bed. It hopefully is easy to just drift back to sleep. Um, the problem is, inevitably, 
I either end up tripping over something or stubbing my toe on something and that shoots me wide awake and then I'm awake for quite a while. Um, so, as we think about that, which is probably an experience a few of us can relate to. The title of my message this morning is A Lamp Unto My Feet. And today I want to discuss the importance of knowing God's Word. As Christians, we need to know the Word of God so we can fend off not only the attacks of the devil, but at times, even our own selfish thoughts, motives, and desires. See, when we don't know the Word of God, it's just like stumbling around in the dark. And we're pretty likely to trip on something or stub our toe, or do something to hurt ourselves. We need the Word of God to know where we're going. We need the Word of God to know how to love God, and to know how to treat one another, and care for those in need. We need it to encourage us in our faith, and to grow in holiness. And finally, we need it to be able to really understand what we believe and why we believe it. So that if anyone should challenge us about what we believe, we've got some way to respond. Now, as we read, Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know, wouldn't it be nice maybe when you get up in the middle of the night to make your way to the bathroom, you had like a little night light down on your feet <laughs> just to kind of light your path. Um, not a bad idea, maybe I should have. Uh, anyway. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the Word of God indeed lights a path for us to follow. And if we follow that path that the Word of God shows us, life is ultimately going to be a lot easier for us, and it's all going to make a lot more sense. See, the Word of God teaches us how to have a better world. Because we can't get around the fact that we live in this fallen world. And we're going to have to deal with trouble, and we're going to have to deal with sorrow. But the Word of God teaches us how we can do our part to make the world better. Because we have to live in it. You know, we're called to be in the world, but not of the world. We don't do things the way the world does. We do things the way God wants us to while we're in the world. So we have to know the Word of God to be able to do that. But you know, all too often we step off the path and we want to do things our own way. Follow our own thoughts, our own motives, our own desires. And we end up suffering the consequences of our actions. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. Does anybody out here have something they consider a life verse? For a lot of people, maybe it's Jeremiah 29, 11. You know, I know the plans I have for you. Um, you know, some people have a life verse. This is my life verse. There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. Because it has resonated with me so often in my life. When I start thinking, eh, you know, maybe it's okay. Maybe I can do this or that. Or, this isn't exactly the way the Word of God says I should do things, but maybe I can find a way to justify it. You know, 
Um, and so I come up with something in my own thoughts and my own reasoning, and uh, it seems right. I mean, how many people out here have ever, if you have children, ever said to your child at some moment in time, what were you thinking? And your child probably went, well, I don't know. <laughs> you know. Because, uh, yeah. Seemed like a good idea at the time, right? You know. There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it's the way of death. We know that when Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted, he used the word of God to answer every attack, every temptation that the devil brought against him. And it's the same for us, my friends. The Word of God is our defense system against the attacks of the devil, and sometimes even against our own thoughts and desires. In Ephesians 6, 17, the Apostle Paul calls the Word of God our sword. Without it, you have no ability to fight back and so the devil has no reason to flee. Rather, he will continue to hound you until you grow weak, until you lay down your shield, and you succumb to his attacks. We don't want to be fools walking around in darkness and tripping on every obstacle that either the devil our, or, or our own selfish desires might throw in our way. Remember this in James 1, 13 through 15, it says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. See, oftentimes we do it to ourselves. We don't even need the devil to tempt us. See, we still have the remnants of the old man of sin crawling around in our flesh. Constantly calling us back to that old love for sin. But what does the Bible say to us? How do we possibly deal with that old man of sin that keeps calling us back and tempting us to go back to our old ways of sin? Psalm 119.11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. If you keep the word of God in your heart, you'll be compelled to do what's right and flee the ways of evil. I can't tell you how many times in my life knowing the word of God has helped me to stay on track. And even if I get off track, the Word of God calls me back to repentance and renewal. It's just like I said with that verse. There's a way that seems right to a man. But in the end, it's the way of death. So many times when I try to make an excuse or find a justification, that verse calls me back to right thinking. It does away with my excuses. It does away with the lies I try to tell myself. It does away with all my self-justifications. The Word of God will do that. If you have it in you. If you have it deep inside you. And while it will remind you right and wrong, 
it will also assure you of forgiveness and encourage you to keep moving forward in Christ. Second Timothy 2.15 says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need, need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word truth. At the end of the day, that's how I want to be. I want to be able to present myself to God as someone who has been refined by his word, casting out shame and having learned to correctly handle the word of truth. This passage also instructs us to be competent ministers of the gospel. <coughs> Someone who can deliver the gospel correctly because you know the scriptures and you know how to teach them. Such a person is not going to have to be ashamed of falling into error because if they know the scriptures really well, they probably won't fall into error. But even if they do, they'll have the word of God to call them back to right thinking. And if your heart is right before the Lord, you will submit to that correction and come back to right thinking. You know, when we do Bible study on Wednesday night, I don't just go there and throw open the Bible to whatever chapter we're doing that week and start talking about it. Maybe I could because I've been studying the Bible for a lot of years. But I don't. I spend time going over that chapter. I look at commentaries to see what other theologians have had to say about it. And take time to consider how to rightly teach that passage of Scripture. And, uh, and Kathy... Kathy, what's that book you bring? Vernon, J. Vernon McGee. J. Vernon McGee. She brings this book. It's basically a commentary, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. She always brings it to Bible study and, you know, occasionally tells us some of the input that that, that book has to offer. And that's all good. Because learning to correctly handle the word of truth means being willing to listen to what others who have studied it, studied the original languages behind it and things like that, have had to say about what it's telling you. Now, it doesn't mean the Spirit of God can't help you to rightly understand it and rightly teach it, but we also have lots of resources. You know, many of you may own a study Bible that has little notes in there that help you understand what you're reading about, and that's all good. You know, it's good to dive deep into the Word of God because the more we study it and the better we understand it, the easier it's going to be for us to apply it to our lives in the right way. We need to be well trained in the Word of God. So we can defend it if somebody comes along and challenges us about what we believe. Has anybody here ever had somebody try to convince you that what you believe, that your faith is illogical or doesn't make sense? Anybody? Happens to me all the time. <laughs> you know? Um, the better we know the Word of God, the more we are immersed in it and understand it. The better we are able to defend that kind of stuff. First Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope you have. Now that's not just the Word of God, but the Word of God is a very important part of that. Now, beyond the Word of God, you can also tell people about the things that God has done in your life. 
Now here's part of why I believe, because I saw God do this and this and this, you know. But being able to defend the Word of God, to know the Word of God and understand it is a big part of it as well. <clears throat> and we need to be able to clearly explain the gospel to people. We must understand it ourselves so that we can clearly explain it to other people. We don't necessarily have to fully understand it to believe it. Faith is a gift that comes from the Spirit of God, and there are there is a certain mystery behind it. I mean, you don't have to like understand every theological issue to be able to put your faith in Jesus Christ. You know, I think I might have mentioned this before, but sometimes my wife, when I'm talking about theological things that I'm studying, she'll go, "Do I need to know this or understand this to, you know, you know, for, is it important to my salvation?" I'm like, Good. <laughs> so no, you don't have to be an expert in theology to have faith in Jesus Christ. But understanding it as well as you can is good for being able to relay it to other people, the gospel. The Holy Spirit helps us to understand the gospel and it can help other people to understand the gospel. But a good foundation under us is important. Developing a firm foundation on which to stand means putting the Word of God deep within us. If we have the Word of God deep within us, it will speak through us and we will be able to speak to other people about it. We are called, and we can see it from the scriptures we've already looked at, from the moment we become Christians, from the moment we put our faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, we are called to be students of the Word of God. There's nowhere in the Bible that just says, put your faith in God, Put your faith in Jesus and then just go along as you are. No, we are absolutely called to become fervent students of the Word. Even in the Old Testament, knowing the Word of God was paramount to a successful life. Here are a couple of scriptures from the Old Testament that tell us. Joshua 1.8 this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Remember what I said about the Word of God helping us to make the world better. That's exactly what this is. Meditate on it day and night. Don't let it depart from your mouth. Be careful to do all that's written in us. Then you will be prosperous and successful. It'll make your life better. It'll make life better for the people around you. And it will help you do your part to make the world better. Deuteronomy 11, 18 through 23 you shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in your house, and when you are walking by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give them as long as the heavens are above the earth. Basically, in everything you do, in every part of every way of your life, the Word of God should be flowing through that. 
You know, write it on the doorposts of your house. Let it be part of your conversation. You know, let it be something you're talking about as you're going about on your way. But the Word of God should be in you, flowing through you, and around you. That's who you are in Christ. The Word of God is meant to be living and active within us. In Hebrews 4.12 it says, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Only the Word of God can do that. Only the Word of God has the power to rip right through all our sin, all our excuses, all that junk. It cuts to the heart of who we are and teaches us what's right. Make no mistake, it's because someone believed the Word of God, learned the Word of God, and spoke the Word of God, that you came to believe the Word of God. This is meant to be a chain reaction event in our lives. Somebody learned it, and lived it, and spoke it to you, and so you came to believe it. And in the same way, you are called to learn it, to live it, to speak it, and influence others, so that others may go on to do the same. And on and on it goes down the line. And the Word of God changes the world. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your Word. Without your Word, we would be lost children stumbling around in darkness. And that's not who we want to be. We thank you for the richness and the depth of your Word that teaches us simple things and also deep and complex things. Help us, Lord, to hunger for it, to thirst for it, to desire it to want to go deep within it so that it may flow through us in all that we do. We ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. This time, we will be doing communion. We have somebody to pass out these elements. As we are preparing for communion, I just want to remind you of the things that I usually remind you about communion. Communion is our opportunity to be in unity with both God and unity with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And therefore, when we take communion, we want to ask ourselves, are we right with God? Do we have any unconfessed sin? Are there things in our life that are coming between us and God? We want our relationship to, with God to be right. And so we can take a moment to deal with that before we partake. We also want to think about, am I right with my brothers and sisters in Christ? Do I have things between me and somebody else? Is there some ought or hard feelings or anything, unforgiveness that exists between me and a brother and sister in Christ? If there is, when you come to the Lord's table, purpose in your heart that you're going to do everything you can to make that right. And if you do these things, then you can come to the Lord's table with a right heart. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come to your table, to commune with you and commune with our 
brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, help us to do it, to come remembering you, to come for the forgiveness of sins with a right heart, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me, the body of Christ given for you. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The blood of Christ shed for you. If you stand with me, we'll sing the doxology again. trespass against us. Lead us, us not into temptation, but, but deliver us from evil. For thine, thine is the kingdom, kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 You may be seated. At this time we're going to sing praise song number 55, There is a River of Life. done this one for a very long time. We'll see who remembers it. And we'll do it twice.
I like all those old gospel yeah. things that are a little bit snappy. <laughs> anyway, may God our Father bless you and keep you. May Jesus, who is the Word, 